All right, good morning. Uh, and welcome to the uh, Enterprising Women of Commerce. My name is uh, Candace Shiver, and I'm really excited to be here with each of you today and to take part in this important program. Um, permit me to first give a special thank you to Karen Krugman, uh, Sonora Cobbs, and uh, Erica Foy McFadden. Uh, thank you um, for uh, creating a forum uh, where we can come together and we can um, highlight the work, the talent, the perspectives of leading women here at Commerce Department. Uh, it's really reassuring, at least to me, uh, to know that uh, we really don't have to go far uh, to find uh, models of achievement and, and models to emulate. Uh, these ladies are right here within our reach, uh, and that's really exciting. Um, thank you to each of you also for being here with us. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, in, in your programs, you'll find a survey and we're asked to please uh, give your comments uh, by the end of the program and please turn those in. Also, please turn off or put on vibrate or mute uh, your cell phones. Now I, um, I take the privilege of introducing to you and presenting to some of you um, our guest speaker this morning, Ms. Alejandra Castillo. Uh, she has humble beginnings, a, a unique story, um, an impressive career from serving as executive director of the Hispanic National Bar Association. Uh, she was a practicing attorney. She served in the Clinton administration and now in the Obama administration where she was at the International Trade Administration and is now the national director of the Minority Business Development Agency. She is the first Hispanic American woman and the second woman to hold this position. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I can tell you, I work very closely with Alejandra and she has what so many desire, and that, that's a passion for what she does. She's hardworking, she's dedicated, she takes seriously the opportunity to mentor young women, and so I think it's very fitting that uh, she's been invited to speak with us this morning. So I won't talk any further, I know you're excited to hear about what Alejandra has to say, and we're just gonna engage in conversation, we'll receive questions from, from you, and then we will conclude with a holiday social hour. So Alejandra, Let's begin uh, with your background. I think you have a remarkable story, you know, particularly of the influence of your family, your environment, and your childhood. And it's often said that um, who we become as adults and professionals has a lot to do with our experiences early in life and the, and the values that we gained. Um, how has your upbringing uh, influenced your decision making and led you to become who you are today as a professional and, and maybe even as a woman? Um, you can tell why Candace is, um, is always so admired. She, she does everything so well. No. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm a big fan of, of Candace. Um, and I have to say that because um, it's uh, people at all levels that influence you. Uh, I believe life is a journey and it's an individual journey. So you cannot share anyone else's journey but your own. And you cannot enrich your journey but looking inward. Um, and that question, Candace, is, is, a, is a great question and a question that I think we should all ask. You know, how have our experiences through life shaped us? Um, and what's the perspective that we have moving forward? Um, my parents came to the US um, fleeing a dictatorship uh, most people think about Castro as the dictatorship of the time, but in the 1930s, the Dominican Republic had a dictator who was uh, in power for over 30 years. And my parents' youth was uh, very quashed. And uh, they said, you know, the hell with this. Let's go for, uh, for opportunities. And they, they, they came to the U.S., to New York City. Um, but they came with a, with a really... Um, a chip on their shoulder that they understood that freedom was something you had to cherish and that you had to work for. Um, and entrepreneurship was a ticket to a different life that the US, the United States of America, could best provide. And I, I emphasize that because um, when you grow up from an immigrant community, sometimes you feel most, more, more patriotic than, than ever because you realize that your parents came to this country not by birth, but by choice. And um, 
when my parents came here and they understood that by creating a business, they could change the entire future of their entire family. Now, what does family mean for me? My father had 13 brothers and sisters, my mother had 10. That in itself is a community. Um, and like many of us, I had the crazy aunts who always had an opinion, and I had the crazy uncles who would always, you know, make you laugh or cry at a party. Um, but that was my family. Um, and my father created a business in the Bronx, and he hired all of his siblings. They all worked there. Um, and they all um, made successes and failures based on that business. So as you can imagine, a small business owner, you would sweat it when you couldn't make payroll or when an inventory was short. Um, so you know, just to answer this question, I lived um, my life through the eyes of my parents. And that was a, a message where failure was not an option. Um, I was uh, talking to my colleague, Al Bet Betancourt, about being a translator. And because I was the firstborn in my, in my family, I was the one who, learned how, who had to learn how to speak English really fast. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, if you're a translator, like Francisco here, who does a great job uh, translating, if you're a translator, that means that when you get stuck on a word, your brain is trying to look for that word that's going to translate that meaning in its entirety. And I know that Al is chuckling in the front because when you're a kid and you're trying to translate between Spanish and English, uh, or whatever uh, language, you are put on the spot to be able to translate things perfectly. And I'll just take a minute because this really uh, is embedded. Uh, at the age of seven, I remember coming from school and you know, you want to get home and watch cartoons. Well, that was not my reality. My reality was that I could walk into my grandmother's apartment, I could hear the voices in the kitchen, and I knew immediately that a neighbor was there waiting for me to get home so that I could translate the letter from the social security office or the housing department or the food stamp or the doctor. And as a child, I remember like, oh my God, here I go again. But there was, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It was that my childhood was not a, that of a child. It was that of a, a community person. And today I look back and I say, you know, what a wonderful experience. That, that was fabulous. Not only that, but it also helped me to learn two languages. Um, and it also helped me to learn how to deliver bad news sometimes and try to figure out a solution. Because, and just to wrap up, when that letter said, um, because of your failure to provide certain documentation, your social security benefits will be suspended, I had to understand very quickly, okay, that means that she needs to get her, uh, her doctor's letters in order, that means that she needs to get some uh, documentation put in uh, together. So I was able to look at the bad side and quickly pivot What's the solution? How do we help that? And I think those are the, um, those are the wonderful experiences growing up that if you, um, if you look at life just asking yourself, well, why didn't I do this and why did I do that? Life will go by and, and you'll miss out. But when you look at life and say, okay, what are the opportunities? What are, how can I make it better? Then you build skills that are fabulous. So sorry for the long-winded no, no, no. conversation. <laughs> no, thanks for the But this is a conversation, and, and I hope that we will stir up some, um, I see some people nodding, which is always a good thing, uh, but that will stir up some memories that you may have about what makes you so special and unique, and maybe rekindle that, because sometimes in the workplace, we get very dull. We do everything over and over again. We're very mechanical, and, and the joy of life we tend to, to, um, to miss out on that. So that's the type of conversation we're gonna have today, hopefully. Absolutely. No, thank you. you. From your childhood, you learned about entrepreneurship, problem solving, uh, and so on. And you probably didn't think that you would be national director of NBDA. Was that, I don't know if was that in your, your thinking during childhood. So you and I had a conversation at one time about our paths, you know, paths and career. They're, they're not always straight. Maybe they're never straight. Mm -hmm. You know, they have different twists and turns, and we don't always know what the next <clears throat> step will be. Uh, we have one thing in mind, and it end up being something different, totally different. And you have had some experiences to um, 
to, to, to have what may be perceived as non-traditional roles for women, uh, even your, in your current role. Um, how, has, how did you, uh, you know, stick to it and accept these non-traditional roles, no matter how they may be perceived by the public or outside? You know, that, that's a great question because um, I really think, just as you said, the path is never straight. And be very wary if it is, okay? I would, say, I would submit to you, be very careful if you think that the path is so straight and because life will, the beauty of life is those curveballs. Um, now, are they, um, are they painful? Sometimes they are, you know? And I'll, I'll be very honest, um, as, a, as lawyers, passing the bar is the most important thing in your life. Well, I failed the bar the first time around. And so did I. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and 10 years ago when I failed the bar the first time, I would have never, ever confessed to that until I read, and we're so appropriate because we're in a library, until I read um, Governor Duval Patrick's bio, uh, bio. And he admits there, he says, I didn't pass the bar. And how, uh, you know, for a lot of us, it's like you want to just hibernate for the next you know, 20 years because you're so ashamed. Sure, sure. But you know what? From that, I learned um, that if I really wanted to be a lawyer, and for me, being a lawyer was a, a second, uh, uh, um, a new career. I went to law school after the White House, and we talked about it. Yeah. You know, after being at the White House and working for Bill Clinton and, you know, getting your paycheck and being, you know, all these exciting things, then I chose to go back to being a student, eating cereal, you know, not getting a paycheck, you know, spending a lot of time in the library. It was a very dramatic change. But I said to myself, my goal was to be a lawyer, and if I live life without pursuing my dreams, I will regret it. And life is about no regrets. So um, going back to your initial question, you know, the curviness of, of the journey is where you find the richness of your friends and who you are at the end of the day. Who you are and what are you made out of because surviving law school, uh, I joke around that I, I, I went to, I left the White House to get sanity at, at law school, which is always a chuckle because <laughs> you never go to law school to get sanity. Um, but in comparison to where I was in the Clinton White House, that was, uh, that, that made sense. But, um, you know, again, at the end of the day, you want to live your life, and I think this is the best test. If you, if the New York Times was to write your obituary, what would you like it to say, right? Live life as if, if someone was going to write your obituary and say, Candace was X, what would that story be? And I think that's what we should all think about. Um, what do we want to do in life? Who do we want to touch? What, what impacts do we want to do? What contributions do we want to do? Are we going to walk through life always looking down, bitter, sad, angry, upset? Or are you going to look at life and say, you know what? It's a cloudy day, but it's a great day to watch a movie when I leave uh, work tonight. You know, what do you look forward to? Um, MBDA provides that. And, and I'll just pivot. MBDA provides that because we're seeing the country change. It's undeniable. It's changing. And change is good. But how are we going to embrace that change? How are we going to make sure that minority companies are growing, that they're creating jobs, that they're investing in their communities? Sure. Um, how do we make sure that um, there are no more Fergusons in the country? How do we make sure that there are more, there's more prosperity for everybody, not just for the one percenters? How do we make sure that as policymakers, decision makers, some people are here from ITA, from NOAA, from EDA, from from all the commerce agencies, what, what role do you play in making sure every day that you're coming up with a new initiative, a new policy, a new program, something that your supervisors will say, wow, they're thinking out of the box. This is possible. How do we push the envelope instead of just coming to work from 9 to 5, which rarely anybody in this room works from 9 to 5. I know that because mm -hmm. I see a lot of you, you know, going out of the building late at night and early in the morning. But what, what contribution do we make? Where's our voice in this process? So that, that's kind of, um, yeah, yeah. again, a long-winded answer. No, no, yeah. well, that, that leads uh, to, to another thought. You know, as you talk about you know, what, what impact are we making, what are we doing here, 
um, you know, we're in a, in a unique position here at the Commerce Department. And I think sometimes we, um, we under, undervalue it. Sometimes we overlook it, maybe even take it for granted. Um, but uh, every now and then I, I take a, a look back and I say, God, it's, it's, it's really significant to serve in the Obama administration uh, and, and you to have served in the Clinton administration. How would you advise everyone here to, to really take advantage of uh, the resources, the exposure, the opportunity that we have um, right now at this time? You know, we're, we're all under budget constraints and we, uh, my, my colleague Albert Chen is, is here too. We're now fighting for our FY16 budgets. So budgets, it, budget issues are a big uh, uh, concern for every agency. But I would invite you, after you leave here today, whoever is in your chain of uh, supervi uh, supervision, what's the training budget for your respective offices? You know, they'll probably say, we don't have much training dollars. However, right now there are lots of courses, um, and, and then I'll get to the point why I'm raising this. There are a lot of courses online. There are a lot of information that you can um, access that is not expensive. Because here's the point, and this is why I'm bringing this up. You are responsible for your own growth. Your work environment is responsible to nurturing that growth. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for your growth. And um, uh, Tuba, who's, in, who's a, a colleague and just joined MBDA, is here. We talk a lot about how are you growing. We're, we're at, in December 2014. Ask, your, ask yourself the question, and, and I, bring my, I bring a book everywhere to jot down notes and, and things. Ask yourself, in 2014, what did I do to nurture my growth? Did I read a new book? Right? Did I find a new author? Did I follow up on a new concept that came to me? You know, for example, we're talking about social impact investment. What does that mean? Corporate B, I don't know what that means. I need to figure that out. How is it, what's the impact? Ask yourself, is there a topic of discussion and conversation in my portfolio that I really want to become more knowledgeable in? Because I have to say, a lot of it starts with us. If you're not growing, if you're not pushing the envelope, if you're not learning something new every single day, then you're failing yourself. So I put that as one component. Now, as managers, we have a responsibility as well to make sure that we track our employees and our staff and our team and see how they're growing. If we're not giving them challenging tasks, if we're not recognizing their job, their work, if we're not praising them when they do excellent work, then we as managers are also failing. And I take that responsibility seriously. As a matter of fact, tomorrow we have, MBDA is having its employee award ceremony. And we've, we've created new categories because there are people on, in our team that are doing fabulous work that they don't necessarily fit in that kind of that little box that we traditionally have done. So we've created new categories. Um, the Rising Star Award. We're in a workplace that is intergenerational. We have folks that are, you know, baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, I mean, the alphabet soup, millennium. How do we engage them? Um, we spend a lot of time in the workplace. I spend more time in, the, in my office than I do with my family. And, um, and I, there's a lot of guilt in that because that's the way life in the US is, right? You work a lot. Um, so what are we doing to nurture ourselves and what are we doing to nurture our team? Because when we have a positive workplace, guess what? We will feel more comfortable leaving our offices because we trust that the team together is going to do the job, that it's not just going to fall on our shoulders. So there's a lot of things that I've, I've mentioned in, in this long-winded an, uh, answer, but um, we need to dissect that a little bit. Uh, it's, it's very, um, we need to unpack it. The workplace in the 21st century is suffocating. And the reason I say that is because we're spending way too much time in the office. Um, and the question that I ask is, is spending more time in the office a function of efficiency? Is spending more time in the office a function of doing more work? Maybe it's not. Maybe we were just spending too much time in the office and not being efficient with our time and our resources and our abilities. Um, so we need to ask ourselves those questions. And managers need to be more understanding 
that life today um, is very complex. So, anyways. No, thank you. Um, you know. <laughs> Similar to managing people and, um, and making people feel included, um, one of the things that I admire about you is that you, you, you take seriously mentorship. Uh, you take the time to, to, to speak. Uh, Tuba has oftentimes uh, mentioned to me how much she appreciates you, that you listen to her. And um, that's really hard to find sometimes in the workplace, a true mentor, whether it's someone of your same age, uh, excuse me, same uh, gender or not. Um, how significant is mentorship to you and how do we create more good mentors in the workplace? I, I think it's a, someone came to me the other day and said, oh, can you mentor me? And that, my first reaction, in all honesty, was, am I that old? <laughs> um, <laughs> But then I caught myself, obviously I didn't say it, that's, that's just the, the vanity in us speaking. Um, then I said, you know what, of course, absolutely. Because I was, um, I, ha I have amazing mentors. And um, they come in all sizes and shapes, in all ages, in all gen in, in every, you know, gender, geography, social strat uh, income stratus, they come in all shapes. But you have to be open to having a mentor. And that means that um, a true mentor will tell you when you have a crazy idea. <laughs> a true mentor will tell you, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> um, a true mentor will also say, you know what? You have this amazing talent. Have you thought about this? Um, a true mentor will, um, is not going to be sitting with you every week on a regular schedule. A true mentor may be somebody who you haven't spoken to in 10 years, but you pick up the phone and you call them and they, you, can, you can hear the excitement in their voice because they're happy to hear from you. Um, and those are the type of, uh, of characteristics that I hope I have uh, with, when I mentor. Um, I'm very strict because I think that um, I'm still pretty, I grew up in that, in that generation where there are certain fundamental things that you must do before you can say, you know, I want to be the boss. Um, and it's hard because the millennials have a different perspective. They're like, you know, I should be the boss. I went to school, I have my degree, why can't I be the, <laughs> and, and you never want to, you never want to, you know, offend them, but you want to walk them through the process and say, you know, managing is not, is not easy. You have to love people to be a good manager because people come with all of their personal and, and, and frustrations and, and issues. So you have to love people to be able to be a good manager. But you also have to be able to say, take, take on the work because it's a lot. Um, so it's walking through um, the, the individual. But I'm gonna make a pause because okay. I brought, to this uh, forum, all of my favorite books. Well, not all of them, obviously. But some of my favorite books. We're in a library, right? There's nothing more powerful than a library. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think about Justice Sotomayor. If you haven't read her bio, I really invite you to do that. She has a wonderful story. Um, again, she, you know, she's a woman who comes from the Bronx. Her father passed away when she was very young. Her mother was a, a nurse, um, and she made it through, and she, she struggled. And, um, and now she sits in the highest court of the nation doing some wonderful things. Um, if you haven't read her dissenting opinion on the Michigan case regarding diversity and the need for diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. I suggest that you, that you read it. It's, it's long. It's 80 pages. but. It's, it's nice to know that there's a woman on the Supreme Court who is looking at how America is changing and how things have to uh, include um, diversity and uh, not just in terms of ethnicity but gender. So I wanted to make a pitch for that because I think it's a fabulous book. Um, Arianna Huffington, you may not think of her uh, in terms of uh, a possible mentor, but you know, this book that she wrote uh, maybe a year and a half ago, it's called Thrive. It's very different from Sheryl Sandberg's book. Uh, but she pretty much says, and she opens the book up by saying, you know, I woke up one night 
uh, dazed and confused in a pool of blood because I, I passed out out of exhaustion. And she broke her nose, and it, it was a turning point for her. Because sometimes we, we work so hard that we forget to take care of ourselves. We don't sleep, we're not eating properly, we barely go to the gym, if at all, if we even know where it is. Um, <laughs> which, which, by the way, a funny joke, I've paid my membership at the gym here for two years now. I went in there once. <laughs> um, but Ariana Huffington has a, a wonderful quote. She says, um, life is a dance between making it happen and letting it happen, right? That's very powerful, because we're all focused on making it happen. You have to take a step back and let life unfold and let it see and, and surprise you. So, great book. Hope you, hope you take a look at it. Um, and then, Carla Harris, uh, really amazing woman. Um, we have a, 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 a video on our, on our um, MBDA website. She spoke at our Med Week. And she's truly a powerful, a powerful woman. And, uh, and she has some great, um, Great insight. She said something at our med week, and you may remember, Candace. Uh, she said when the, when the crisis happened, a lot of businesses hunkered down, and they, they were very conservative, and they didn't want to do, make any move. And she said, for her, that was great, because when everybody hunkered down, she could see the landscape, and she could see the new opportunities. Mm, and from a visual perspective, that was, that was very telling. She's a, she's a strikingly beautiful, tall woman. Um, and when she went like that and she said, I could see the landscape, I realized it's when times of crisis that you sometimes need to say, where's the vision? I want to be that vision. I want to look beyond and over the crisis and see what the horizon has to bring. So she was very powerful. Absolutely. And I'm going to leave Maya Angelou, who for me is a wonderful, um, extraordinary human being and writer. So we're going to leave her to the end because... Uh, uh, I want to close with her. But I wanted to pitch the books uh, because that's what nurtures me. Um, and I was telling Candace, I, I have books everywhere in my house. And uh, there's a book on a daily basis that I read in the morning just to kind of set your mind, get you ready for war. <laughs> um, so books are very important, and that's what nurtures me. I agree. We all, we all need something uh, to inspire us and keep us uh, pushing and going on a daily basis. So thank you for sharing that, Alejandra. Uh, at this time, we can receive questions from the audience.